So, just put a couple slides before we get into the notebook. Um, so this is a, a project that I've been working with as part of a larger project looking at um, landscape evolution in the Colorado Front Range. Um, and uh, this is a little aspect that's developed out of that of thinking about what happens when you start thinking about uh, feedbacks between the hydrology and the geomorphology, which produce a heterogeneous uh, surface where you have exposed bedrock in some places and soils, relatively thin soils in other places. Um, and this is, like I said, in collaboration with Greg and Suzanne and Bob. And I want to just, you know, Greg kind of already went through this, but from the kind of geomorphic uh, view, the, one of the simplest uh, visions we have is this kind of characteristic parabolic form to hill slopes. Um, this is just a view out of my, my brother and his house in his backyard, right? And so when we start thinking about simple models, um, there's two simple models that uh, we can bring in right into Land Lab or components in Land Lab that basically are just solving for mass balance between the flux downslope and the conversion of, of um, uh, bedrock to soil. And so one of those is the kind of creep model that Greg had in um, his notebook. Um, and it's just saying that, you know, there's a linear dependence with slope um, in the sediment flux. And that's what gives us our uh, parabolic form. And then oftentimes, um, and this is based partially on uh, observations, it's par partially on um, em empirical measurements of soil production rates. We fit something like, uh, this is an exponential uh, soil production function. Sometimes people argue for a humped one where it, it goes down to zero with at zero bedrock. Um, but these are basically two core components that a geomorphologist, if they have soil and they have the surface, might include. Um, but what happens when you go to hillsides like this? So this is just an image I took um, uh, near Gold Hill, Colorado, up in the Four Mile watershed. Um, it's actually in the scar of the Four Mile wildfire. And you can see it's very heterogeneous. There's in the background, you see steep bedrock cliffs. In the foreground, you see some bedrock tours and you see relatively thin soils that are kind of dispersed in between. And so uh, the goal that I have is, can we replace this kind of general soil production, generic soil production function with something that is more process specific? And in particular, I've been experimenting with uh, processes that might be conducive towards an agent-based model. Uh, I'm going to think about trees. I'm going to share with you a little bit of my thoughts on trees. There's lots of things we might consider with trees when it comes to soil production. This is just a conceptual figure from a paper and review paper in 2013. I'm really only going to focus on kind of what the biomechanical weathering component of uh, tree roots might have on producing soil, right? So we might think that roots grow to a certain depth, they grow at a certain rate, so we can actually relate that tree property to a soil production rate in an actual landscape. And this is really kind of building off the backs of other kinds of models that are similar in spirit, albeit not using a, an agent-based model. So these papers by Gabay Mudd and Roaring et al, including Jill here, who's here with us today. And <clears throat> I just want to give you a brief, um, instead of the net logo model is there for you that I developed, um, or I should say a simple version of the one I developed is there for you in the, in the repository. But I thought I'd just give you a conceptual model of what, what's go actually going on in this agent-based model. Um, our agents are trees. They're basically born by seeds. So they have some seed production. They have some seed fertility. Uh, they have some seed dispersal properties. And uh, then there's some, uh, when they live, they have an area. So the red uh, domain here is basically the patches on this kind of cartoon grid where they might have resource competition. So you can imagine that their growth rate shouldn't just be some simple uh, plant functional type function, but it has to have some sort of resource competition associated with it. So there's a neighborhood that matters. And this is where the agent-based modeling really is well suited to it. Um, and this is quantified through this term that I use. It's just a resource stress term that allows the resource stress can alter the, the growth rate, it can alter the fertility, it can alter the death rate. Um, and then the idea here is that the only mechanism to produce soil in this, in this model is through trees uh, interacting, get, getting their roots down to the bedrock soil interface. So if trees start growing in places where there's already soil, then they just grow happily in that soil. But as soon as their roots come in contact with the interface of bedrock and soil, then 
they can start converting bedrock into soil. And so this is only, like I said at the beginning, only one potential role trees play, but it could be a potentially important one. I'm interesting to see how these dynamics may play out with uh, our more simpler models of um, soil production. And so basic framework, net logo, I'm gonna use to simulate the forest dynamics and the soil production. And I'm gonna use land lab to simulate the erosion sediment transport. So there's both the kind of vertical loss of soil and that then being spread out across the landscape. So we might expect different results if we actually have a, a proper transport model. And to give you, for those of you who are familiar with NetLogo, I've, I've, I've kind of listed out all the variables that are in the model They're on the right-hand side. You can kind of look, just look at the left-hand side. There's basically three basic categories of things going on in the model. There's the trees, the individual tree, the forest dynamics. Those are in turtle in the NetLogo parlance. Those are the turtles in my model. And then there's the patches in my model, which um, are carrying states like soil depth, elevation, things like that. And those patches are what I'm going to actually use to link with um, my land lab model, which is modeling the soil erosion transport, with a variety of potential feedbacks. Okay. In fact, the version that you guys have is a simpler version. So some of these feedbacks are going to disappear. Um, but you can imagine we can add as many of these feedbacks as we, as we might want. And all the bolded text that I put on that right-hand side, those are just inputs. So those are things that we can now start playing with you know, what is the dispersal distance, characteristic dispersal distance of trees? What is the maximum rooting depth of a given plant functional type? So we can start evaluating the sensitivity of these different things. And then the key thing is that I'm using PyNet logo to link the two as opposed to building it all in a Python uh, environment. Before you get started, so only, oh, I just yeah. want to ask this a technical question. Uh, trying yeah. to follow along. Um, my PyNet logo doesn't load because I don't have something called JPyte. J-P-Y-P-E, does that ring a bell to anybody out there? I ran into the same problem. It's, uh, it's whether you, it's, so in the documentation, um, it'll take you to how to install the Java stuff, but I still ran into problems uh, with what directory the Java was in. But that's what oh, it's yeah. referring to, and it's one more step in the installation instructions. Yeah, so, and it, in, it is in the PyNet logo documentation, and the, Java issues are real, and also the version of NetLogo you have is real. So uh, if you have the latest version of NetLogo, it will yep. not work. Oh, so, well, well that, that fixes that, so I do. So, yeah, yeah, so um, and I, in the notebook, I have some comments to that effect. To, to, okay. to, to, All right. Basically, it works with 6.0 and not 6.1. So uh, hopefully, I had to learn that the hard way myself uh, as I was learning this, uh, and then the documentation improved and said, oh, we don't support 6.1 yet. So. Um, okay. Be forewarned. Oh, that makes me feel um, so much better. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I struggled through that myself. I was like, I think I'm doing everything right. But um, it, it turns out that uh, it's just not supporting the newest version. So any of the versions of 5, NetLogo 5, it will work with. And uh, 6.0, it will work with. And hopefully, they'll, they're working towards getting to work with 6.1. The final, final little, uh, oh, sorry, is there any other questions that popped sorry. up? Sorry, yes, uh, thank you. No, no problem. Um, the final little piece is that uh, I have a bunch of these slides. I'm not going to show them. I don't think I'm going to show them until, until the end. I want to get to the notebook first. But one instinct or insight that can be gleaned right away before going out and, and trying to link a landscape evolution model with this forest dynamics model is that simply adding some loss term like erosion uh, means that this interesting question from the, in the geomorphology community is that we can actually produce steady state landscapes that have a heterogeneous bedrock to soil cover ratio. And so this is all done in like net logo I did here is just I'm plotting up soil fraction as a function of time for a given set of input parameters and showing you that it does uh, obtain a steady state soil fraction uh, scenario for different values of erosion rate, if I only allow erosion to happen in the soil. And so I have a few other like sensitivity plots I might show to you guys at the end, but this was what gave me pause to say, okay, now we need to stick an actual proper uh, sediment transport model because how robust are these kinds of results that I'm kind of hacking into a net logo model. All right, I'm gonna switch now to the, the notebook. Uh, 
see. I'll not share that. Hopefully I got the right one. All right, do you guys all see my my uh, notebook? Yeah. Yes. Yes? All right, perfect. So there's there's a the model I I I'm going to leave that as a black box right now. It's a little model I developed with all those components in it and now I'm just going to show you how we can couple something simple like the uh, linear diffusion style model that uh, Greg was showing uh, to iterate through letting the forest evolve and then diffusing the landscape. Uh, a couple of things about this notebook, if you're trying to run it, uh, here it says right at the beginning, you need uh, 6.0, not 6.1 is that first thing. Uh, you need this model, obviously. So this is how you would call any sort of model um, if you want to start bringing it in. Um, in this case, you just keep it in the local directory. I am using uh, the Seaborn library for data visualization here. So, um, and then I've also added this thing where there's a, a CSV file. I'm sorry, I didn't update this. Um, or you can use an, an Excel file. This is a way, so in that logo, it's very easy to seed a random number of agents. Um, this takes, you can just impose what age, where you put agents in are in the model so that when you're running it, you always have the same initial condition. So. Um, it's it's not required to run this notebook, but if you want to compare plots as we go through, it'll be easier to just look at uh, kind of apples to apples. So at the beginning here, we're just going to import all the packages we need from Landlab and from uh, Matlab, Matplotlib. Um, one thing to note, and I'll say this below, but uh, PyNet logo uh, basically brings in grids as pandas data frames. So you need to you need to deal with um, converting them over from data frame, pandas data frames into um, uh, the grids that are used in, in, in LandLab. So let me just run this. I'm gonna open that logo here. Uh, I strongly encourage you to set this uh, GUI flag to false. Uh, things run uh, tremendously faster if you're not actually using, doing all, doing all your visualization in Python is really, really handy. Um, and then here I just have a check for the version just to make sure you meet that condition of having an acceptable version for high net logo. I've stuck this figure in that is just like the figure I showed in the PowerPoint, um, only it's showing you which elements of complexity I've removed, right? So I've got strike throughs on all the pieces um, that I took out of this simpler version of that logo, right? So we've gotten rid of some of the, the potential feedbacks. Um, but it'll at least illustrate to us how we can pass grids back and forth, and we still get some pretty interesting um, dynamics out of it. So one of the nice things about using PyNet Logo is that uh, you can take your knowledge of the syntax of NetLogo and you basically just stick it into these command prompts. So this first uh, the cell here right below part one is really just saying, I want to command Net logo to do a bunch of things, and are right, all, all these strings are just telling you how to. Those are in the net logo syntax. So in this case, I'm just setting up, I'm loading the model, and I'm setting up all of these um, parameters that are important, um, like the initial number of trees, the tree root max, the tree age max, the seed max, the seed dispersal, and the seed fecundity. Um, and then once I do that, I can set up the model. Might take a, a second. Um, and then this is this optional cell I was telling you about. So this is just the piece where if you want to stick in a CSV file or an Excel file that that has the initial position of all your agents, um, this is it's really simple. You can just bring it in as a, a pandas data frame and you can um, you know you can check it out. Um, we'll map it out real quickly. I I I set the initial uh, coordinates of four trees. Uh, that are equally spaced apart from each other throughout the, the model domain. And so we can go ahead and map that out. So it's, we're going to, the first part here, we're going to report where all those trees are from that logo. And then we're going to also get um, this net logo dot report. We're going to pull some of the constants that are buried within the net logo model, because I want to show you some relationships that are implied by using this model. 
And then we're just going to make a figure. Um, and this figure on the left-hand side, I'm going to go ahead and run it. On the left-hand side, I'm just going to show you where the initial tree locations are. And on the right-hand side, I'm going to show you what my root function actually looks like in the model. So it's just telling you that in this version of the model, I've specified the age of the trees. They have a lifespan. I don't have them dying before the end of their lifespan, so another version I do. Um, so in this case, they all live to 100 years. And that they, their roots will grow um, initially very fast, which is based on the published literature around root growth dynamics. And uh, it reaches some maximum value at the end of its life, uh, and it slows down. So the root growth slows down with age. Now, I also have this term, this is this resource availability term that is, in my case, encapsulating resource competition from neighbors. But you could imagine using it also to capture uh, variable climate, uh, variable rock soils types. Um, so you could use this resource term to actually uh, affect the dynamics a lot. And what you're seeing is that if I have a value of this weight of one, then I grow on my maximum trajectory. And then anything less than that, I grow at a slower rate. Um, the actual tra trajectory of trees doesn't look like these simple curves because during their lifespan, there are new trees that are being born and old trees that are dying. So their trajectories are jumping on and off of different versions of these curves. And so like before, um, we're going to use this patch report. So this is uh, another function. There's only uh, uh, less than a dozen um, uh, uh, functions really within PyNet logo, but they're all very powerful because they allow you to basically either get information from that logo or modify things that are in that logo. Um, so in this case, we're going to report all the elevations. Uh, I set it up so that I actually am dealing with elevation, uh, the initial condition in that logo. You could do it either way. So here I'm going to report my elevations, I'm going to report my initial soil depths, and then I'm just going to plot them up. So here we go. So I'm starting from an initial condition where there's zero soil depth. So this right hand side is good. It means it worked. There's no soil anywhere when I start the model. I've set up a, a ramp of around 36 degrees, um, basically going from the north to the south, uh, pretty similar to the setup that uh, Greg had in, in his example. And now we can go ahead and run the model. So when we run the model, uh, you have to give it some time, number of time steps to go through. So this is something, again, we talked about earlier, you have to think very carefully about, especially as we start coupling them, because you want to make sure those time steps make sense. Um, and we're going to report back the locations of all the new trees that are produced in the model. So the second um, bundle is telling us. And then we're going to report back all the resultant soil depths. Um, and plot them up. So, so let's go ahead, run it. Shouldn't take too long. And unsurprisingly, you know, I spent the, I set them up so they're equally apart. So we have these four little clusters of trees. Notice that the original trees are gone, right? And so the legacy of those other trees is in the soils, not in their current locations of trees, right? Uh, you know, one of the very important parameters in this model is uh, the dispersal distance. So if you have a very short dispersal distance, then you can set in this particular model, the forest can go extinct. It can, it can die um, because they can't get outside the resource competition. If you set the dispersal distance very wide, it's like having random seed generation all across the landscape. So I have a pretty tight uh, dispersal distance here. So you're going to see these clusters. It makes it easier for us to see these clusters as they grow through time. And then the other thing we can look about is we can, we can use PyNet logo to start uh, looking at attributes about our, our agents and then using all the power of the statistical packages and plotting packages in Python to, to interpret them, right? So it's really nice because in this particular example, I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to report back the age of the trees, I'm going to report back the soil depths, um, and I'm going to report back the soil fraction, and then just plot them up as histograms. Um, and so, you know, we didn't run our model for very long. In general, this distribution of tree ages, if I don't put a resource death on these trees, it basically will bounce around where you see equal distribution at all ages, right? So there's just as many trees dying at any given time as there are born at any time. 
Now, we ran it for a pretty short time, so we're really sensitive to the initial conditions that we have. And then we can also plot up, we see we got to have a distribution of soil depths. I just want to point out, in this particular version, I have a maximum soil depth of three meters. Um, it is very rare to produce an actual soil of three meters because they're all competing with each other. And so there's being scaled. So it's the rare tree that gets outside the patches that can grow for its entire life at that maximum rate. So you're seeing most of our trees in this particular example, um, I should say, most of our trees had grown only to soil depths of around half a meter, right? So we get this very skewed distribution. And again, that's because we have this resource competition. And so this is just, this first example was just meant to show that you can drive everything in NetLogo uh, within a Python interface. And um, uh, there's some really, I, I should stop here and say there's some really nice tutorials on PyNetLogo where they do a, a nice job of showing how you might do like a sensitivity analysis. So if you wanted to parallelize your net logo runs so that you had a bunch of different runs and you want to do the uh, statistics on it, um, it's a way more efficient way to do that than trying to um, work with the net logo itself. Um, or at least I should say you have a, the, the full uh, advantage of all the Python packages that exist to do those things. Um, so running a headless version of NetLogo, pretty straightforward. There's just a couple of different kinds of commands you would use, these report commands and these set commands um, in order to do that. So in the second example, I'm just going to, I have basically three parts. The second part, I'm simply going to uh, do one time step at a time, one bulk time step at a time. Um, I'm going to run NetLogo. I'm going to uh, uh, run land lab and then I'm going to run net logo again just to make sure that I'm passing things back and forth and the final example is actually just bundling all it up into a for loop to see what that might do over longer time scales so so let's talk about passing variables between net logo and land lab I'll stop right here if there's any questions or comments so this is this I mean this works very much like our net logo as far as I can tell I don't know if you've used that or not but where you have our primitives that you just plug in within your R script to, to do stuff. I, I, in fact, I think in the documentation of PyNet logo, they've taken their inspiration from our net logo. So it's, it's, it's exactly, I think you're exactly right. It has the same job of problems that our net logo does too. So yeah, probably. probably. <clears throat> okay. So, um, in, uh, you know, linear diffusion or uh, soil creep, is actually a relatively uh, straightforward thing to implement in that logo. So if I were only doing that, I actually think it would be just as easy for me to do that in that logo. Uh, the, I think the real advantage of bringing it into land lab at this stage is that there's four different possibilities we might want to use for our diffuser. We might have a linear diffusion model, a nonlinear diffusion model, a depth dependent diffusion model, right? We have all these components that already packaged and ready to go for being in the, in the, in the land lab interface. And so um, really that's where the power of it comes. And so that's what this is all with an eye towards is we're going to basically do our sensitivity analysis on all these different variants of alternative hill slope sediment transport models. Um, today, I'm just going to show you the, the simple case using linear diffusion. Uh, so in this first cell, I'm going to reinitialize the model. So uh, because I've already set up all my inputs and you could set this up with a text file too, um, I'm just gonna reset it up to that initial condition. And the second uh, patch here is, is just telling me I wanna read it in from that uh, CSV file for the initial conditions again. The one uh, new thing that I'm doing here is now I will also wanna set up my land lab grid at the same time so that it, it matches, right? We need these grids to to conform to each other. So the sizes and the dimensionality of the grids need to be the same. And like I was saying before, uh, PyNet logo brings these things as pandas data frames. Um, so all I'm doing here in these uh, second two steps here in, in a cell is setting up my land lab grid with uh, uh, what my patches represent, a DX, uh, a total time that I'm going to run. So this time I run 1,000 ticks, which uh, I am my functions are kind of set for a yearly time scale. So that represents like a thousand years. And then I have to set this uh, similar to the way Greg dealt with uh, diffusion, having this depth dependent diffusion so that you didn't have uh, production of soil on very thin soils that wasn't due to the processes we care about. So, um, 
So I'm going to set that characteristic depth of the fusion. And then um, this is just setting up my initial uh, land lab grid with its boundary conditions. And very similar to what Greg showed before. So I should forget if I ran this. Doesn't matter, I can rerun this as many times as I want because we're starting from scratch here. And then I'm going to add some fields. So in this case, I'm going to add a topographic elevation field, a past elevation field, a soil cover field, and a soil depth field. And I really should rename the soil cover field. It's actually my diffusion coefficient field. Um, because I'm using it to modify the diffusivity as a function of soil depth. Okay, so that's very straightforward. Um, let's run NetLogo and uh, uh, send the values to LandLab. So, you know, we have to give NetLogo a command it recognizes. And in this case, I, you know, I've just set it kind of if, um, so that I can have any time, I will just send it to this go command. And then I just send netlogo.command go. Um, and then I have to, con when I report the elevations and pass them to LandLab, I need to uh, convert them to the size that LandLab is expecting. So that's all, what all these little things are doing. I'm just reporting the elevation, passing to LandLab by reshaping it. Same with the soil depths. And then um, I'm calculating this diffusion coefficient um, field based upon the depths. Now, this is exactly like what uh, Greg showed. Uh, he had one minus this exponential. I put 1.00001, and it's it's because uh, if I have a zero uh, diffusion coefficient, it, it raises lots of errors in in um, the your linear diffuser. So basically, this is effectively like saying I have a diffusion coefficient that's 10,000 times slower than the, the maximum value I'm using for places that have soil. So it's a very, very slow, it's actually an extra source term for sediment in the way that I'm doing the model, but it's, 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 it's very small with respect to the, the soil depth. And then I'm also gonna print out the mean depth um, for comparison later. So this will tell us how much soil is being produced and also tell us, kind of help us keep track as we redistribute soil, are we, are we doing anything weird by moving soil around with the way we've set our, our um, diffusion model itself. So let's run it pretty fast. Thousand years runs pretty, pretty good. Um, but we're gonna see when we do, go ahead. So the question, I mean, you're, it looks like you're running, just running that logo, you've set it up, then you're just gonna run that logo for a thousand years, but with not, without any, so I was wondering if, I, I, maybe you're gonna do this later. I thought maybe you'd wanna step you know, one I am. year through NetLogo and then do land lab and step through NetLogo. Yeah, so in the for loop, I'm going to, I'm going to put steps in. Oh, okay. So, so I just want to show that we can pass these variables back and forth. Got it. Got it. And that's going to be really important, right? This gets the sensitivity of what are the right time steps to choose because do I want to do NetLogo at an annual time step? Because that's going to be really computationally expensive. Or in the example I show, I do the half-life of a tree. So every 50 years, I run, I run that logo for 50 years and I rediffuse the landscape. So I'll show that in the for loop. Okay. Okay. So we have this, we've run it in that logo. And so we're ready to redistribute the soil. So much like Greg showed, I'm just going to um, initialize the diffusion component. Uh, and then all I'm doing is I'm going to uh, keep my elevations from this step and I'm going to record them in the in what I'm calling this ZP, which is the prior Z. And then I'm going to diffuse the landscape and then I'm going to recalculate the soil depth. So that's all I'm doing um, here. So let's go ahead and do that. And now we can make the same figures we made with the initial conditions, uh, exactly the same plotting functions here. And we can look what we get. So we now have this kind of patchy soil that is inherited the initial condition and you can see we get this droopy diffusive landscape right so there's uh, lots of these little kind of droops that are correlated with where we've actually had trees so it looks very linear uh, like we would expect for linear diffusion in the places where the trees haven't made it to yet so that makes good sense with what we're thinking and we look at our our mean depth 0.052 good we had 0.052 before. So we're, we're not like doing anything weird with the soil depths here. We're, we're preserving the soil, we're just moving it around. 
And then the other thing I want to show you is I'm just going to do another figure that shows uh, how the elevations have changed with respect to the initial condition. So I just run that. And the initial condition is this red line. And you can see I have places where I've accumulated soil. I have places where I've eroded soil. And in this particular case, because of the way I set up that initial condition, it's concentrated kind of in these uh, two quarters of the, you know, in the middle of the landscape, it looks just like the initial condition, but you can see stuff is marching its way downhill. And I'm going to go real fast to this part because there's not much new here. The only thing that's new is I now have to take that uh, uh, elevation data and send it back to NetLogo. So it means I need to put it back into a data, pandas data frame, and I'm going to do that um, using the pandas. And I'm going to then use the pynetlogo.patch set to reset that the elevations and the depths. I'm going to go ahead and run it. I take a quick moment. Okay, and just plot it up again. Now, this is just a check for me. Uh, in this version of my net logo model, I don't have any feedback between the elevation and it's only a one way feedback, right? So elevation is getting modified in land lab, but not net logo. So my elevation should look exactly the same because I haven't sent it back to land lab. But if we compare our soil depths, we can see we produced a lot more soil now. So you can just see this is the style of step we would run. And then I'm almost done here. I guess the only thing I'll say here is this is exactly what uh, Michael is bringing up. We don't want to run this for a thousand years of forest dynamics and then, uh, and then diffuse a landscape. We would want to set some time step that makes sense. So I've set the land lab time step here to be 50 years, which in this case is half of the average lifespan of a uh, is basically the half of the average lifespan of a tree. Um, I'm going to run it for much longer. Uh, Everything else is the same. That's just setting up the initial conditions. And this is everything I had in the previous parts. Just highlight this, um, except I've just bundled it up into a for loop. So we're just going to run it for the range of time and see what we get. Now, it still take a few uh, minutes to run. So um, I guess it would be a good time to bring any questions out. So you're still using the go command on this. Uh, unless I you, am. Unless you've defined go. I mean, normally Go is 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 a is a loop in NetLogo, uh, but you can also do a one do a one a one shot. Go. I guess you're just running Go once, right? Yeah, and this is I be, to be clear. This Go that I am um, the variable Go. Uh, yeah. Perhaps I should rename it. It's not the same as the Go command in NetLogo. I've defined the whole string as Go, so I set what that time step is. By okay. defining the string up above. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So in this case, by me putting uh, my dt of equal to 50, it's running go for 50 time steps. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And it's just constructing that string dynamically so I can okay. monkey around with it. Okay. Any other questions while we're waiting for this? Uh, So I have a question. So what do you think is going? What do you think is going to happen if we run? So if, if we go back to what it looked like after this was after a thousand years, but not iterated, um, we're now going to run it. We're now running it for four thousand years, um, but it's iterating over much shorter time steps. So I'm curious, what do you think is going to happen to the topography? How's it going to look different, or will it look different? I'm excited to see some clustering. You see some clustering? Okay. Thanks for sharing this stuff. Yeah, of course. Much appreciated. Other ideas? Let's see if we're, how we're doing. Will there be net erosion over that time? Well, so the way, so this is really important how you set your boundary conditions and, yes. uh, you know, in this case, I'm not uh, uplifting the landscape, but I have a closed boundary condition at the top of the, uh, the, the model domain. So it means that there's no input from the top. So stuff is just trundling downhill. 
Um, and that's, that's, you know, you and there's no exit kind of imagine, at the bottom. Well, it is the bottom is held constant. So it's effectively like having an open boundary condition at the bottom. Yeah, I thought there was. So that's why I was thinking it would overall, there'd be some deg degradation. Right. So if I added uplift, you might expect that it could evolve towards some steady state. In this case, we might expect if we we're just doing diffusion, it would start relaxing down because I'm just holding this at a constant elevation. That's right? what so I meant, so that a, it would decrease. Yeah. It would, there yep. would be some net loss. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so you Let's would see. expect that. Okay. Yeah, a yeah little bit. exactly. Yeah. yeah, and we're only running this for 4,000 years. So let's run it. Let's, let's plot up what we see. So, okay, so one thing I'll point out is, and it's a little hard to see, uh, it's hard to find good color ramps to, to show this, but you get these little uh, pockets of, of uh, I would call them Torah-like features where they're kind of, they get abandoned and they still seem to be on the landscape. But oh, because we ran it for a long time and because we iterated through shorter time steps, we get a much smoother landscape, it looks a lot more like a diffusive landscape. And of course, we've allowed more soil formation to happen. We started with no soil, and we've allowed more time, so it means that uh, more of the landscape has been covered. But even after 4,000 years, there's a lot of places with zero soil depth. So it's, it's, it's telling us that it takes a long time for this particular mechanism, given this particular configuration, to actually uh, uh, produce soil all across the landscape. And so maybe an easier way to show this is to, to plot up that same initial condition versus the current condition. Um, and hopefully the thing you see with this is that I've, I've printed out the mean elevation. So this is to Mary's point. We've actually got net erosion, which is good. So it's behaving in a way that makes good sense. Um, it used to be 142. Our initial condition was like 142. And we see the same kind of like bouncing around that initial condition, but it's getting a lot tighter. Um, and it's getting a lot tighter around that initial condition because places that are have bedrock exposed are trapping soil from uphill and therefore you're smoothing out the landscape but at the top of the landscape we're getting something that looks more like our parabolic uh, uh, top right but notice and it's again very hard to see even on this parabolic top there are these places these individual patches that are getting abandoned because if they can't if if they can't get uh, if they can't stay contiguous with the uh, soil that's fluxing downhill, then they will get abandoned because they never have, if there's nothing flowing into them, they're never gonna get new soil until you randomly get a plant up there. So they, they can stick around for a very long time, even though you're smoothing out the landscape. And then finally, we can get a cleaner, a cleaner look at um, the distributions that we looked at at the beginning. So we now get cleaner distributions. We can look at, yeah, we get something like uh, equal chance of all elevations and a, again a very skewed soil depth distribution but even if we run it for a long time we don't get very deep soils and that's because we have resource competition going on here so um, I'll stop there because I've talked a lot uh, but uh, I thought I'd open up for comments and questions that there's not very many feedbacks that we've included in this one but it's it's still still quite interesting to Matt, one thing I think is really interesting about this is that you, you get very smooth terrain, but really uh, bumpy uh, depth to bedrock. Your soil depth yep. is super heterogeneous. It, it doesn't get smoothed out. That's right. And that's because, and part of this is, uh, you know, the, the, the paired thing to do is start with the initial condition of, of some soil that could be lost, as opposed to starting with zero soil. So it takes a long time I'll just show uh, one other thing very quickly. Uh, wait, oh, let's stop share. Um, share. So this is just back to that PowerPoint. Sorry, I should have advanced this. So this time scale of which, even if you had no erosion, so that's what these plots are showing, is there's no erosion. This is just a net logo model looking at the kinds of time scales and their sensitivity to these different input parameters. It's pretty long. So 
for me to cover the entire landscape with just this mechanism of soil production, it's taking on order uh, thousands to tens of thousands of years, depending upon the uh, uh, input parameters I've put for the, the, the tree dynamics. Um, so I'll, I'll just stop there, but that's, that's why you're, you're still preserving these little nubbins. All It takes a long time just to randomly occupy those places where you preserved a little, little tour. That's awesome. Hold on a second, that's super cool. Um, <laughs> and I have to say that, you know, your uh, end results from the model with, uh, as Greg was pointing out, the, um, even though you have a relatively smooth surface topography, that the soil depths are really variable. That's what we see with GPRs that we see. I've seen with a lot of field digging uh, in similar locations. I, um, so that's great, that's, that's awesome um, output. I'm curious, and this is uh, just kind of from my own personal interest, uh, in the more complex stuff you're running, have you played around at all with where you have trees having higher diffusion rates or are you always applying a uniform diffusion? Yeah, so that's, so that's something I didn't talk about, but uh, we can imagine there's two feedbacks that I'm actually explicitly trying to link to the model. One is using the density of trees to set the diffusivity constant itself. So that, that's a link to not only soil production, but it's a link into the diffusion. Um, and also that could, you could in parallel, think about using that as setting the cohesion of the, so you can think about that from a mass wasting perspective too, right? So if you have high root density, potentially that could stabilize these soils, depending upon, again, your initial conditions, your boundary conditions, all these things. Um, the interesting thing that I didn't show in this example is that when you, when you add resource deaths, so when you say trees don't just live for 100 years or they don't let's just live for 200 years, uh, what happens is you get this selection process, this feedback in, this, in, the, in the agent based model that enables deeper soils. So if you just looked at the soil cover over time, it looks very similar uh, to not having that variable lifespan. But if you look at the actual soil depth distribution, it alters it quite a bit. And so there's actually some really interesting dynamics in thinking about, well, do we actually know what these functional relationships should be so that we could make a, a prediction of soil production that is based upon plant properties? 